Professor Cohen has a lot to share today. Um, I just wanted to make sure we had a really quick touch point about some key events that happened in our world relating to the election on Wednesday. We had class on Wednesday, but a lot of things happened while we were in class and after class that it's important just to note and think about with regard to the election. And I'm gonna talk super fast. Um, so the first thing is that in the morning of Wednesday of last week, as you know, uh, President Trump announced or was making comments about why moving so quickly on uh, the Supreme Court, filling that ninth seat. Um, and he stated pretty clearly that he, it was because he thought the elections would end up in the Supreme Court and that it was important to him to have not a 4-4 decision, but a ninth justice. In, in essentially saying that it was important to, for him to be able to appoint a ninth justice that would rule in his favor with regard to the elections. Um, so that happened Wednesday morning. And then you all know that shortly afterwards, very shortly afterwards, he named Amy Coney Barrett as his nominee. She's an academic from Indiana. She worked with Justice Scalia. That was her mentor. She's an originalist, which means um, that both her and Scalia believe that judges should attempt to interpret the words of the Constitution as the authors intended them when they wrote them. You know, and as Professor Cohen has described in great detail, they were slaveholders. They were, there was a lot going on at that time. That's very different from now, but still originalists believe that uh, she believes, and Scalia, as Scalia did, that you need to interpret the words just as they were intended by those slaveholding uh, constitution authors. Um, she belongs to a very conservative Christian faith group, People of Praise, that has been really a big concern to LGBT and abortion rights activists. Um, she has sided with Trump on every single aspect of immigration, and people see her as a real threat to the Affordable Care Act and reproductive justice. So that happened. He named that he was going to do this. He did, he did it shortly thereafter. That happened Wednesday morning. Of course, that same day, everybody I'm sure is aware of what happened with Breonna Taylor, um, that the Attorney General of Kentucky, Daniel Cameron, announced the grand hear jury hearing results, which indicted only one of the three officers involved in the shooting and killing of Breonna Taylor um, and only for reckless endangerment with regard to her neighbors. Nobody was indicted with regard to her killing. Um, and it was based, the fact that nobody was indicted with regard to her killing was based on the argument that her boyfriend had shot at the officers, of course, denying black people of second amendment rights guaranteed to pretty much everybody else. So this sparked protests nationwide, which are ongoing. That was also Wednesday, but most of you I'm sure heard that in response to being asked about Breonna Taylor, he, President Trump um, and the protests going on as part of that conversation was asked if again for the 20th time, <laughs> what he would do with regard to peaceful, the peaceful transfer of power, should somebody else be elected other than him? And he basically said, well, let's see what happens and get rid of the ballots and then there won't be a transfer, there'll be a continuation. So this wouldn't be concerning in and of, its, in, in of itself because he said something like this many, many, many times, um, but that combined with everything else that happened on Wednesday, and in particular, this Atlantic article that came out on Wednesday that reported that um, the Trump campaign had been in conversations with Republicans in various states, namely Pennsylvania, but in other states as well, um, basically talking to them about the idea of handing the electors over to the Trump campaign um, regardless of what happens with the, um, with the actual vote. Or in other words, if the vote, basically if the vote is not decided on that day that there's this conversation happening between the Trump campaign and Republicans in these states to essentially basically hand over the electors for the electoral college over to the Republican side, over to the Trump campaign. And um, you know, there've been various analyses of exactly what does this mean? What could this look like? Um, but, you know, basically what this could look like, there are many different scenarios, but one that was really kind of the major takeaway from this Atlantic article is that um, on election night, he could be well ahead because he's encouraged his people to vote in, in person. A lot of Democrats are voting by mail, so they're 
ballots may come in later. Um, and he could say, we need to stop the counting. Um, and at that point, it's possible that Republicans who control state legislatures in places like Pennsylvania could say, yes, we are at this point going to hand over the electors to, um, to the Trump campaign. And then through legal maneuvering, you could see a decision similar to what happened, what we covered with the Bush versus Gore. So given all of this, I'm talking super fast so that I can hand it over to Professor Cohen. Given all of this, the recommendation, of course, is everybody needs to vote. There needs to be no question. There should be a landslide, um, you know, because the only way to really stop all these legal maneuvers and kind of the, the hijinks um, is to make sure that it's very, very clear that one side has won and the other hasn't. But I think given that, um, you know, even if there is a landslide, if votes come in after the night of the election, there is still an issue, right? There still could be a real issue, especially if the counting stops. And so that's why vote, 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 as I've said in the past, has been the only recommendation often of the left. Vote, 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 vote can't be the only thing that we're thinking about. And it often isn't the only thing that people in other countries think about when it comes to elections. We're going to talk a lot more about social movements and how people engage with elections in other countries. There was a really powerful uh, article um, that Stanford, Stanford did an entire study, folks at Stanford did an entire study on, even in the United States, do protests matter with regard to elections? And the answer was resoundingly yes. They looked at 2018 and whether protests had an impact on the elections and they found, statistic, statisticians found there was a clear resounding impact on elections. And so um, that is why many people in the United States are already starting to gear up for massive protests. And I just wanted to share images from just this year. We, we think of America as exceptional. We think of America as one of the greatest democracies or thus far we've thought of it that way. I just want to say that people in other countries don't think about democracy and democratic engagement with regard to just voting. They engage in other ways. This is an image from February in the Dominican Republic where it wasn't even the presidential election, it was municipal elections led to massive protests. There were um, real suspicions of things going wrong with the voting machines. And so municipal elections were suspended um, and the people ended up in the streets. There were nationwide protests um, over these municipal elections. And similarly, I'm sure you all have been watching in Belarus, um, which frankly, this, this is not the first time people in Belarus have been protesting against um, Alexander Lukashenko, the president. He's been around for six terms. There were massive protests, especially in 2006, called the Jeans Revolution, because a lot we can talk more about why it was called the Jeans Revolution. Um, but uh, there were several thousand people coming out every week for a while. There was severe rep repression against those folks. And then um, the most they ever got to was 45,000 people. And so I think what is no what's noteworthy about what's happening in Belarus right now, this is following the presidential election August the 9th, uh, is that it's reached 200,000 people in 10 cities coming out every single Sunday since August 9th. And they're coming out in between Sundays, but Sundays are the big days when people are coming out in 10 cities. And so why do I bring this up? As Professor Cohn has pointed out, Dominican Republic and Belarus and pretty much every other country in the world are very different, have very different histories, have very different systems, but there is a way of thinking about engaging with elections that's different than here, which is that there is a thought that um, it isn't just about vote, vote, vote. It is about engaging and exercising democratic rights in other ways. And so even in the United States, there is a lot of talk right now, and I mentioned this last time, about a massive protests directly following um, the election and even before it, but directly following the election. One of the efforts is this coalition, Protect the Results, uh, which you can go to their website, protecttheresults.org. It is a lot of my allies in the social movement space. Um, everybody, Indivisibles is a part of it. Uh, Center for Popular Democracy, 
just a ton of groups that we work with are part of it and Color of Change. Rashad Robinson from Color of Change is coming on Wednesday so we can ask him and talk to him more about this, but they are already planning to mobilize um, right directly following the election. I just want to say in advance of, of Wednesday and then next week when we talk about social movements, I think what, what this group and many others are talking about and why I share the examples from the other countries is we have a tendency in this country to, um, to, to do our protests a little differently. Um, you know, we do see, we do see, a, we've seen amazing protests with Black Lives Matter all around the country. Um, they're, you know, obviously they're happening in various cities. Some cities have had longer length of protests than others. Um, then we've had these moments after Trump's first election, we've had these moments of massive gatherings like the Women's March that are one days. And I think, you know, the analysis of groups like Protect the Results and looking at other countries is to really kind of push back on Trump trying to maintain power or the Supreme Court or states handing the election to Trump, it would require the scale of the Women's March with the length and breadth of Black Lives Matter. I'm gonna say that again. It would require the scale of the Women's March, which is a one day thing, with the length and breadth and substance, sustenance of what's happening in Portland or some of these cities. It would, it would require both scale and sustenance over a long period of time. You know, Belarus is in its eighth week, I think this week. Um, and they have, they've been doing this for a long time. They haven't succeeded in getting Lukashenko out, but um, but anyway, we can talk more, more next week about why in social movement theory, we talk both about scale and breadth, not just one city, not just one place, not just one group of people, why we talk about scale, and also why we talk about sustenance over time. Both are critical to get to the kind of movement level that you need to, um, to topple a, an illegitimate authority. So just some food for thought before Rashad comes next week and to just, just to acknowledge in 15, less than 15 minutes, what happened last week and where we're at right now. Thank you. That was, uh, th yeah, that was great. I think that, that all of that is extremely important. We do need to be preparing. Um, I think absolutely those of us who believe, you, even just who simply want election results with integrity definitely need to be uh, preparing. So I appreciate um, very much the the um, the references, the historical and global framing of exactly that question. Um, I am curious, though, what why why did they call it the genes revolution? <laughs> I hadn't heard that before. <laughs> There's a whole documentary about it. It's pretty good. I, I'll share more next week. Yeah. Oh, okay, right on. <laughs> All right, so what um, I'm going to talk about today is the question of the political party system, the two-party system, and how it's evolved over time. Um, but I want to get into two preliminaries, and then we'll dive into this, this question about the two-party the two system that we inhabit. The first of which uh, is, if you don't know, now you know, the, de the first presidential debate is tomorrow night. It starts at 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Um, Trump is tweeting this morning about how Joe Biden has refused to take a drug test. Why we feel like Joe Biden needs to take a drug test, I don't know, but, um, but we do know that if Donald Trump manages to sniff his way through this as he did in the last ones, then that's clearly a case of projection. Um, he is the master of projection, but like these, these events are enormously tense. Um, they can be hugely anxiety producing for everyone who sits there and watches them. And the real question is, what kind of efficacy do they actually have? Do they, do they win people votes? Do they, do they move the needle at all? Um, I am highly suspicious. I think it will make for you know, big ratings and a lot of entertainment, um, but it is, I don't think anything is gonna change. I think this election is basically locked in. I don't know that there are undecided voters out there at all. Um, but what will be interesting is that for the first time, Donald Trump will openly face an adversary who will be granted equal time. And so for the first time in really four years, uh, someone will have the opportunity to, direct, to talk directly back at, uh, at Donald Trump. 
So uh, we'll see how this goes. This is the first of three debates. It starts, um, as I said, uh, it's going to be on every network. It starts at five o'clock. We will definitely talk about that a little bit on Wednesday. Um, the other is the bombshell news over the weekend, which was that we now have uh, several decades worth of Donald Trump's tax returns. The New York Times has exclusively gained access to a range of Donald Trump's tax returns, which we have not seen for a very long time. And so, the, you know, which we, we've never seen, quite frankly. Now, we've seen bits and pieces have trickled in a year here, a partial statement there, but now we have a, a huge bulk. Now, the Times is sitting on this and they're writing their stories up. Eventually, these the, the tax returns will make it into the wider public and everyone will be able to look at them. But let, let's just some brief highlights from the New York Times story about Donald Trump's tax. First of all, I think the headline issue is, right, that the New York Times has reported on three decades of tax returns revealed that in 2016, Donald Trump only paid $750 in taxes. And in the last 10 of the last 15 years, he paid no taxes at all. Now, I just show of hands how many people here have paid more money in taxes than Donald Trump. I, I certainly have. How many of you pay more in rent than Donald Trump paid in taxes? Yeah, okay. So, like, here's the thing. Beyond that, right, so this is every, every, all of you, right, everyone, all of your parents, everybody, what this is clearly evidence of is that Donald Trump is an extraordinarily committed tax avoidance and cheat. There are on the books evidence that Donald Trump may, in fact, owe debts currently in excess of $1.1 billion on all of his losing financial properties. He loses money on every single real estate endeavor he has ever undertaken. He's losing money on Doral, he loses money on Mar-a-Lago, he loses money on Trump Tower, to, to an astonishing rate. Now, this, these losses are what allow him to write off his taxes. Astonishing rates of losses. It's, it's really quite breathtaking, but, Dig into those details and we get some just mwah, jewels, right? Okay, so I know we all wanna know how much does Donald Trump spend on his hair? Well, we now have an answer to that question. He deducted $70,000 in taxes as, a, as, a, as, a, as an expense for his hair. $70,000 on his hair. Um, I don't know what the rate per follicle that is, but it's astonishing. He also managed to deduct $95,464 for Ivanka's hair, which apparently is worth, you know, 15 grand more. But, or, <laughs> or I should say 25 grand more. But like, um, it's astonishing, right? Like this, just the sheer level of tax thievery that is going on here. And indeed, the New York Times offers this phrase at the beginning of their statement that, quote, ultimately, Mr. Trump has been more successful playing a business mogul than being one in real life. Um, and I'll just I quote, you, know, you got to read the, the whole article, okay? This is one of the first rules of reading newspapers is that you can't just read the headline in the opening paragraphs. You have to read to the end because good editors bury the really good shit in the last paragraph. The really kind of zingers uh, that they, they might be worried about getting out of hand, that gets, that, that's in the last paragraph. So to jump to the last paragraph of this article, it reads the following. What's more, the tax records show that Mr. Trump has once again done what he says he regrets. This is from the 1990s, looking back on his early 1990s meltdown. Now remember, Donald Trump went bankrupt in the 1990s when he couldn't make money out of two New Jersey casinos. Who loses money on a casino? Donald Trump loses money on a casino apparently, but like he's the only one probably in human history to lose money on a casino. Um, but there it is, all right? But so he has um, essentially, the argument is that he ran for president to leverage his brand name and his marketing power uh, after having gone deeply, deeply in debt in the, the middle of the 2000s. And that he ran for president as a marketing campaign with no intention or imagining that he would actually win. Having won, it has been, is proven quite toxic to his brand. He's losing a tremendous amount of money. So what you have here then to return to the article is that quote, personally guaranteed Hundreds, Trump has personally guaranteed hundreds of millions of dollars in loans, a decision that led his lenders to threaten to force him into personal bankruptcy. This time around, he is personally responsible for loans and other debts totaling $421 million, with most of it coming due within four years. 
Should he win re-election, his lenders could be placed in the unprecedented position of weighing whether to foreclose on a sitting president. So this story not only reveals Donald Trump's financial states, but it, it, it increases yet again the stakes of this election. And Donald Trump's determination to remain in power now becomes increasingly private. Because if he is not president of the United States, the very real possibility of him facing massive and prolonged tax fraud charges is very, very real. If he's president of the United States, he's safe because his Justice Department won't prosecute him. If he loses, he's probably looking at serious financial penalties, if not jail time. So this is, you know, pretty astonishing drop on a Sunday night uh, from the New York Times. Okay, this story will evolve. We will learn more um, moving forward. <laughs> what I wanna talk about in general is um, the question of political parties and the political spectrum. Where do we get this language about the right and the center and the left and the two party system that dominates American politics? Now, a simple uh, understanding recognizes that the, 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 what we today recognize as the political spectrum, the shape of American of global political ideologies from the left to the right emerges in its current form in the French Revolution of 1789, in the Estates General that led the overthrow of the monarchy in France, the first of several revolutions in France, but that led to the establishment of a, the first kind of constitutional assembly within the French government. And what you had as the, the, this, the States General sat in session in the Palace of Versailles in 1789 through the duration of the French Revolution, the first wave of the French Revolution, you had the right on the right side of the king to his right set his most favored members, the people who were the most directly in power, like, you know, the phrase by your right hand man. So the right hand man of the president sits to the, of the, the, the king in this case sits to the right. And the people who sat to the, pre, the, the king's right were the monarchists, those that wanted the king to remain in power, that wanted perhaps maybe a constitutional monarchy in which the monarch is the sovereign, the executive, but is constrained by a written constitution. And that as you moved across the spectrum of the assembly, it moved from um, the, the right to the monarchists, to the constitutional monarchists, to the centrists that want sort of just simple reform, maybe try and bring an end to the abuses of uh, feudalism and the like, and then all the way over to the left, to the people who sat on the far side, and these were the Jacobins and the Montagnards. These are the far left, these are what we would think of today as the radical Democrats that wanted to abolish the monarchy, that wanted to abolish the rule of the Catholic Church, that wanted to abolish feudalism and bring about a bourgeois democracy led by the rising middle class, uh, driven by the Enlightenment, and this was the left. So you have monarchists on the right, you have pro-democracy Jacobins on the left. And this is where the current political spectrum comes from. We inherited this wholesale. Indeed, the United States Congress uh, assembles itself in a similar fashion in which one half of the part, the, the one party sits on the right side, one party sits on the left, and there is then the metaphorical aisle between them. This is what, you know, people either work across or don't work across the aisle. Like, I mean, the physical space, you know, so here's the House chamber during a, a, a State of the Union address in which, right, you have Democrats sitting and silent on the left and Republicans standing and clapping on the right. And so this political alignment of left and right, born of the French Revolution, you know, in terms of the seating of a parliament remains very much with us to this day. Now, political scientists and meme makers the world over have attempted to remap and map and remap and map and remap the political spectrum. And it should be said, and I give you these memes, these are, let's just be frank, these are all bullshit. This is just stupid uh, in a box, okay, except, except the one about Bugs Bunny, which is truly a work of art, okay? The Bugs Bunny meme on point, the rest of these are trash, okay? But that's not the point. The point is, is that depictions of ideological continuities and the political spectrum are by and large almost entirely ideological in themselves. So an attempt to map ideology is an ideology. Now these kinds of maps, whether they're designed by political scientists or meme makers, depict a political world and its ideological spectrum as broadly fixed. 
and there's a fixed pole on the left and a fixed pole on the right and a more or less fixed center as well. And while people and politicians may move up or down or left or right on the spectrum on these charts, we assume the poles to remain largely stable, fixed in the kind of political firmament of what it means to be left and what it means to be right. This is quite simply not true. No historian would look at any of these charts and see anything other than a temporary articulation of floating and mobile political coalitions. But yet when you make charts like this, they look like it's all cast in stone. If there's any rule about politics in any country at any point in human history, it is that it is always changing at every level, all the time, in ways that exceed any possible mapping in terms of its complexity. Now, we can have, uh, indeed, left and right, but most of what these models represent is the belief, you know, so, you know, the, the, what, what represents the left, what represents the right can change, but most of what these models depict is a belief that there is, in fact, I think that the real fallacy of these models is that they suggest that there is such a thing as a coherent political center that is sort of right and moral and clear that is flanked by dangerous extremisms on the wings, the twin dueling margins. So if we look at the one on the top here, uh, left versus right that runs from anarchism to fascism. So, I mean, this is just s literally stupid. The idea, like where, what, how is it that Nazism sits to the left of Italian fascism? That makes exactly zero sense. This is someone who does not know the difference between Nazism and Italian fascism. Um, but again, and monarchism, like how does monarchism sit to the, the left of Nazism? <laughs> like none of these things make even the slightest measure of sense. But that's not the point, right? The point here is that whoever made this chart believes that the two extremes somehow represent slavery and that freedom sits at the center. Keeping in mind, of course, that it was a constitutional democracy of the United States that enslaved four million people. So the center is perfectly capable of imposing and creating and, and uh, protecting, defending, and expanding slavery. It's not, the fascism did not invent slavery, nor did, nor did communism for that matter. <laughs> um, so these are uh, insane delusions of the kind of, you know, political autodidacts that want to believe that the center can hold and that the margins are where, you know, are, are, are where the political danger is. Now, this is often referred to as a kind of horseshoe theory that sees the right and the left as mirror images of each other. And in the middle of the 20th century, this was effectively orthodox political science. As the critique of authoritarianism and totalitarianism, people like Hannah Arendt and others argued quite succinctly that communism and Nazism were mirror images of each other. And the only thing that kept us together was the strength of the liberal center. Now, this is, I think, the core of a belief in American exceptionalism, that the United States is a unique nation in which that a contested uh, liberal state stands firm between the, the twin extremes of communism and fascism, and that the price we pay for a coherent liberal capitalist democracy at the center is to tolerate lunatics and wackos and others on the fringes. So there's the paranoid style on the fringes, and as Arthur Schlesinger called it in the mid-1950s, the vital center, in which that all things are, are right and good. Now, there's a lot of kind of versions of this politics, but what I, I want you to understand is that the binarism imagined of the single axis, axis, or even the binarism, you know, this, the, mod, the singularity of the, the, four, the, the, the four axis, is the belief not in what's at stake in the extremes, but the essential purpose and uh, viability and essentially fixed nature of the center. That I think is perhaps the most dangerous fiction we have. Now, of course, the United States in this landscape models these kinds of memes because we do indeed only have two political parties. There's sort of a, a right and a, a, a right and a center right and a left and a center left right and we have democrats and republicans and the republicans are the center the, the center to the right and the democrats are the center to the left and that's so in a certain sense when we look at these charts it, it rings true to us in a vernacular way because this is indeed like particularly these kinds of 
you know, this one and this one, this sort of single axis, because that is how our politics is broadly formed. The spectrum, you know, of course, as I said, is nice and all, but what we really have is just is a two party system that is laid out on a flat line. Now, for something so foundational in our history the two, and in our current politics, the dominance of the two-party system, it may be surprising for us to recall that the United States Constitution says absolutely nothing about political parties and their organization. Political parties were not a part of the constitutional process. They were not imagined as part of the constitutional process, except as something that the majority of the authors of the Constitution were desperate to avoid. Indeed, John Adams wrote in 1780, excuse me, quote, there is nothing which I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and connecting, uh, concerting measures in opposite to each other. This, in my humble apprehension, is to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our Constitution. So the, the Founding Fathers warned us quite sagely, in a certain sense, about the problems that would arise in a two-party system. What they often referred to, if you read the Federalist Papers, what they often referred to as factions. Now, of course, given the setup of the presidential elections in the U.S. Constitution with the Electoral College, the design of the Senate, a state-based representational system, and the House of Representatives basis in population representation in specific districts, the commitment to the, what is called in the, in the 18th century, the first past the post, or what we currently know as the winner take all system, necessarily and heavily favors the emergence of a two party system. Unlike a formal parliamentary system in which multiple parties contest elections, in which apportionment is granted proportionally, like the, the British parliamentary system in which multiple parties um, uh, compete and in which they gain seats in parliament by uh, virtue of the proportion of their, um, their ballot, uh, of, of their polling, the United States has a winner take all system. So what that means is that in the US system, there are no points for second place. Losers, you know, winners take all, losers go home. So a third party trying to enter the system is never really going to be able to marshal enough votes to claim victory, let alone uh, the fundamental recognition, the best they're gonna do is be spoilers. They're essentially going to prevent their nearest ally, um, split the vote with their nearest ally and turn political power over to their ostensible enemies. And indeed, uh, it was, in fact, to one degree or another, the national campaign to ratify the Constitution that pitted Federalists against anti-Federalists that was eventually built up into the two-party system, right? So the fight over the Constitution itself brought about uh, exactly the eventuality that John Adams so deeply feared. Yet the two-party system can, by and large, only survive if the party in power recognizes the explicit legitimacy of the party in opposition. So if one party is in power, the system only works if they acknowledge that the opposition party has a right to exist, that they are not some criminal conspiracy, that they're not fomenting a coup d'etat, that they're not out to destroy the republic, but they are, in fact, the honorable and legitimate opposition. And so what you have is this sense that the two-party system is an agreement between the two parties to recognize the legitimacy of whichever party is out of power at the time and recognize the possibility that they too will eventually find their way into power. And so the two-party system is, to one degree or another, not only a system by which the two parties monopolize political power and contest elections, but also offer a yet another check or a limitation on governance. Now, this is a delicate balance between the two parties because insofar as it can maintain that limitation on government power, it can increase and underwrite the possibilities of democratic free speech in the sense that like we Republicans grant the Democrats the rights of free speech, the Democrats grant the Republicans the rights of free speech. But that, that delicate balance, that belief in the legitimacy of your fundamental opposition has broken down multiple times across American political history. It broke down in the 1860s, it broke down in the 1970s, and it is obviously broken right now, right? And so we need to take very careful attention as Donald Trump, right, you know, essentially refuses to believe the legitimacy of a Biden presidency. This is exactly what uh, Professor Jai Raman was speaking of, right? That QAnon, the conspiracy theory, which I'll talk about uh, in a couple of weeks, but the QAnon, this kind of conspiracy theory that's bubbled up out of the far right, believes that the Democratic Party is a cabal of 
child molesting uh, elites who engage in blood libel and who are um, engaged in child sex trafficking rings and are the you know, for a certain form of satanic evil incarnate. Uh, it's hard to have a political uh, two-party system in which advocates and activists in one party think the other are child devouring, um, child molesting, uh, you know, e elites. Right, that QAnon is this rapidly growing conspiracy theory on the far right that is part that is excel. It's Facebook again. I blame Facebook for everything. Um, it is um, that is rapidly devouring the belief in the legitimacy of the political opposition. So what we're faced with is the sense in which the the two party system is extraordinarily limiting and limited, but yet when it breaks down, what we have is a real threat to the existence of democracy. So it is a, a kind of you know worst of both worlds, uh, you know, a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't um, kind of situation. Now, in the United States, third parties do arise with some regularity. Uh, across United States history, there have been more than 1,500 different registered third parties in the United States um, that uh, the spread across our, many, you know, exist for only a single election or a couple of elections, or they exist quite locally, or they made a bid for national power and died, uh, you know, things like this, such as the Know Nothing Party of the 18. Uh, 1830s and 40s, or the um, the American Nazi Party of the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, these were attempts to create political parties that went that did not go very far. Um, two examples that I want to uh, show you, and oh, I, which is to say that despite these 1,500 you know third parties, 95 percent of all the votes cast in the history of American elections have been taken by one of the two main political parties, by either Democrats or Republicans. 95% of all the votes in American history have been for two political parties. Now, on this, the, the third party system, there are two notable exceptions. The first of which I want to mention is the People's Party, or the Populists, which grew out of a rebellion in the South and West in the years after the Civil War, a rebellion against the rise of monopoly capitalism and the modern business corporation, which was concentrated in the urban centers of New York, uh, Philadelphia, and uh, Chicago. What you had was an organization uh, that called itself the Farmers Alliance and the Granger Movement, which organized farmers across the Midwest and the South to form a new political party, a third party, the People's Party or Populist Party. And in 1892, the People's Party ran as former Civil War hero James Weaver for president in 1892. Weaver won 8.5% of the popular vote and actually collected four Western states, including Colorado, Kansas, Nevada, Ohio, and part of Oregon, when Oregon apportioned its um, delegates proportionately. Now, the populists proved to be a, a serious threat to the two-party duopoly, particularly in the South. And the Democrats then, which had political power in the South, uh, mobilized quite explicitly to conquer and swallow the populist party. And so by 1896, as you see in the cartoon down below, uh, the, the Democratic candidate for president, William Jennings Bryant, presented himself, um, and, and there's all of this stuff I could go into in great detail about monetarism and coining silver and you will not crucify mankind on a cross of gold and all of these kinds of things. But the William Jennings Bryant, an incredibly charismatic uh, evangelical um, uh, the, the boy order of the Platt, he's from Nebraska, ran for president and basically uh, captured or devoured the populist party. Um, you know, the Democrats essentially just swallowed the populist party whole and ran um, William Jennings Bryant for president in 1896 and in 1900. So the populists were essentially consumed by the Democrats, leading further proof to the, my pet theory of politics, which is to say the only thing worse than being co-opted in politics is not being co-opted. Now, the other major political party that I want to reference here uh, is the American Socialist Party, founded by American uh, labor uh, and immigrant radicals in Chicago in 1905, uh, with its its charismatic and uh, you know genuinely inspiring leader Eugene Victor Debs, who founded the first industrial union, the American Railway Union, in the late 19th century. Uh, he was a man from Terre Haute, Indiana, born a railroad man, who when he was thrown in jail after the Pullman strike of 1894, was given a copy of Das Kapital while he was in a federal prison for breaking a uh, labor injunction. He then emerged from uh, prison in 18, uh, again in, in 1896, or 1894, excuse me, and de declared himself a socialist. 
and that he then would eventually go on to run for president four times on the Socialist Party ticket in the early 20th century. Now, the Socialist Party under Eugene Debs won a respectable 3 to 6 percent of the, uh, the popular vote, uh, particularly in the 1912 election, where they really seemed to be on the cusp of uh, breaking through into the party system. Um, now, in 1920, however, um, Eugene Debs probably ran his most remarkable uh, campaign in which he garnered more than a million votes in the 1920 election while serving time as a federal prison in an Atlanta penitentiary for giving a speech in opposition to the United States entrance into World War I. He was locked up for violating the, uh, the Sedition Act, and so you get the button here that you see on your screen for President Convict 9653. So a man incarcerated, a socialist, in a federal prison got more than a million votes for the Socialist Party in 1920. Now, socialists would then go on to hold for, and there's a long history that I, I know entirely too much about that I won't belabor here, but the Congress, um, there were two prominent congressmen um, who were socialists. Uh, Victor Berger from Milwaukee ran what he referred to as bridge and sewer socialism or municipal socialism, and Meyer London, who was uh, the, a, a socialist um, from the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Socialists won countless local seats and small, um, you know, local elections, including a Christian socialist by the name of J. Stitt Wilson, who was elected the mayor of Berkeley between 1911 and 1913. Now, these are just some small examples of various competing political parties, um, the populists and the socialists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But really what we have are two political parties. And the two party system is born, you know, itself is effectively born out of the struggle for the constitution, but the current democratic and Republican split is a product of the civil war itself. Indeed, the split drove us into the civil war and it might in fact be doing it again. The story of the two party system in the United States is not one of a static and consistent antagonism, but of constantly shifting coalitions and alliances within the two parties. Relentless, these are, this marks a, a history of relentless and contingent change that has, in 150 years since this particular cartoon appeared in 1869, effectively reversed the positions displayed here uh, between the two parties and their constituencies. Today, the modern uh, Republican Party wins the overwhelming majority of the white male vote, and the Democratic Party, on the other hand, wins between 95 to 97 percent of the black vote uh, within the Democratic Party. So what you see here is that the Democratic platform is for the white man in 1869. The Republican pat platform is for the Negro and the carpetbagger. Um, effectively, uh, between 1869 and 2020, these two political parties have reversed places just simply swap sides. Now that takes a long time, and that is in effect the story that I wanna try and tell. Um, this movement, this massive century and a half realignment has been spurred at every instance by black activism and the black radical tradition. Their entry into politics, their desire to transform American politics, African-American voters in particular. From emancipation and reconstruction to the civil rights movement and the election of Barack Obama has brought about significant increases in black voter participation, black political participation, which has then engendered significant white backlash against these achievements that have forced the political parties to reorganize themselves. As black Americans sought to forge a multiracial abolitionist democracy during and after the Civil War, the force of their rebellion reinvented the nation's politics and realigned the two major party systems between 1860 and 2020. And so what you have then is effectively right that the Democratic Party went from being the party of Andrew Jackson, Manifest Destiny, and the Confederacy itself to, in the 20th century, the party of the New Deal, the party of the civil rights movement, and eventually going on to elect Barack Obama in 2008. In the same time, the Republican Party has moved from the party of Lincoln and radical reconstruction responsible for the, for the 5th, 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to eventually become the party of the modern business corporation and that of racial resentment, what Ian Haney Lopez refers to as how the GOP became the white man's party. Now, this transformation is a long and complicated story, and it is one of those things that the far right 
likes to latch on to with that kind of, oh, did you know the Confederates were Democrats? Yes, the Confederates are Democrats. Congratulations, you've successfully passed 10th grade US history, right? But the two parties have switched sides in meaningful ways. And I would simply ask you to say, which party today openly defends the flying of the Confederate flag? That is a rhetorical question. We know the answer to that. But let's go back and figure this out. Now, this is going to be a 30-minute just blitz through U.S. political history to the best of my ability. And it is going to start with the three revolutions of the Civil War. Now, I get this fair framing from the historian David Blight, who has talked about the Civil War as the real American Revolution, and he is, of course, correct about this. There are three revolutions in the American Civil War that establish the political parties as we currently know them. The Southern control by the Democratic Party begins with Andrew Jackson from Tennessee, who waged particularly waged war on the native tribes and the native peoples of the Southeast, displacing them to the Southwest, right? The Seminoles, the Cherokees, and others in Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama, and displaced them West, opening the Southern, uh, the Deep South, Mississippi, Alabama, um, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas uh, for the Cotton Kingdom. James K. Polk, the next prominent Democratic president, waged war on Mexico and brought Oregon into the Oregon Territory uh, into um, the United States with the in explicit intention of spreading slavery to the new territories. In the 1850s, however, as the Southern power consolidated in the South. In the 1850s, a new political party arose out of the fracture of the old Whig party, a party that described itself as, the, they came to call itself the Republicans under a, a, a party slogan of free soil, free labor, and free men. What this meant was that the modern, the Republican party founded uh, in 1854, out of the, the collapse uh, of the Whigs in the Kansas, excuse me, in the Kansas-Nebraska disputes, um, came to advocate for a position that would prevent the spread of slavery into the territories. They did not want to abolish slavery. The, Demo the Republican Party at its foundation and Abraham Lincoln himself was not an abolitionist. Indeed, they were almost entirely anti-Black. Abraham Lincoln, you can easily find excoriating, terrifyingly racist statements from uh, Abraham Lincoln without too much difficulty. He was a confirmed and committed racist before the start of the Civil War. But what they were committed to was the prevention of the spread of slavery into the territories. And so when Abraham Lincoln wins the presidency in 1860, under the, new, the guise of the new Republican Party, the Southern Democrats, consolidated in the South, imagined themselves to be so significantly powerful that they chose to secede from the Union and to split the country to form their own pro-slavery nation. Um, of course, like, in so doing, they announced their intentions on the basis of slavery. We've already sort of talked about this a little bit, but why did the South secede from the Union? Well, let's ask Mississippi in their declaration of secession. Quote, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest, most important portion of commerce of the earth. These products are particular to the climate verging on the tropical regions, blah, 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 that the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun, right? The ideology of race, the biological distinctions of the races, right? And so on and so on. This is Barbara Field's description of pure ideology in the statement of succession, secession by the state of Mississippi. So what you have then is that the Southern Democrats form the Confederacy. They drop out of the United States. Republicans consolidate control and then proceed to wage a war for the defense of the Union, which brings us to the second revolution of the Civil War, namely that of emancipation. The Civil War, when it began, was not a war against slavery. It was simply a war to preserve the Union. Indeed, Abraham Lincoln said quite openly that if I could preserve the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do so. If I could preserve the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do so. Indeed, again, in, I will quote from this book several times today, W.B. Du Bois's uh, Black Reconstruction America. He writes, quote, when Northern armies entered the South, they became armies of emancipation. It was the last thing they planned to be. The North did not propose to attack property. It did not propose to free the slaves. This was to be a white man's war to preserve the Union, and the Union must be preserved. 
Indeed, the choice, the transformation of the American Civil War from a war to preserve the Union to a war to abolish slavery was a situation forced by those in, who were enslaved themselves in what W.B. Du Bois describes as the great general strike against slavery. And this is what he writes, quote, what the Negro did was to wait, look and listen and try to see where his interests lay. There was no use in seeking refuge in an army which was not an army of freedom. And there was no sense in revolting against our masters who were conquering the world. As soon, however, as it became clear that the Union armies would not or could not return fugitive slaves and that the masters with all their fume and fury were uncertain of victory, the slave entered upon a general strike against slavery by the same methods that he had used during the period of the fugitive slave. He ran away to the first place of safety and offered his services to the federal army. So that in this way, it was really true that he served his former master and served the emancipating army. And it was also true that his withdrawal and bestowal of his labor decided the war. So that the enslaved peoples simply picking up and walking off the plantation to join the Union Army is how slavery came to an end and how the Civil War became a war for abolition. So you want to know who freed the slaves? The short answer is enslaved peoples freed themselves. Full stop. There's no other answer. Indeed, Frederick Douglass, soon to become a direct advisor to Abraham Lincoln, could say the following, quote, there is but one effectual way to suppress and put down the desolating war. Fire must be met with water, darkness with light, and the war for the destruction of liberty must be met with war for the destruction of slavery. And so convinced by, economic, by military needs, the decision to free enslaved peoples was a wartime decision made by a wartime president out of strategic reasons. And so on January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation which ironically did not free a single slave. It freed enslaved peoples currently in jurisdictions in rebellion against the United States, which is to say it freed, the, it, it, it freed enslaved peoples exactly in the territories over which uh, the Union had no control or jurisdiction. It did not ironically free enslaved peoples in the border states, which were slave states that fought for the Union. So Kentucky, Maryland, um, and elsewhere right, in which there were slaves, but these were states that fought for the Union. Those people were not freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancip Procl Emancipation Proclamation is symbolic in the sense that it announces now that the Civil War is a war to end slavery. It is a war to abolish slavery. That is clearly established by the Emancipation Proclamation. And thus we are left with three distinct versions of emancipation. Who is responsible for what is, I think, the most profound revolution in American history, right? And, and keep, make, keep it in mind that when, with the 13th Amendment and the, the, the end of slavery in the United States, what, you, what, what you're watching, what happened in that moment was the single greatest confiscation or destruction of private property in world history. Literally billions of dollars in property in the South became human beings and citizens within a short sp span of time. The mass, you know, as, as Marx would say, the expropriation of the expropriators. This was a revolution, right, of in, in freeing and enshrining the formerly enslaved as citizens. And so you have three distinct versions of it. You have uh, Abraham Lincoln, the great manumitter, in which the enslaved kneels at the foot of Abraham Lincoln, the chains cast to the ground, the black man standing in uh, representation of his family who is off to the side because women and children clearly have no political rights, but the black man does. And he ex and, and Abraham Lincoln gives the, the gesture of manumission, right? In which I free, I free the slave. Now, this is sort of part of the story that it was Lincoln and the, Demo the Republicans and the political establishment that had freed the slaves. The second version is the one I've sort of already given you. And this is a photograph by Timothy O'Sullivan, fugitive African-Americans fording the Rappahannock River, Virginia, August 1862, in which African-Americans just simply picked up and left the plantation and freed themselves. These were often enslaved peoples that fled the plantation were referred to as contraband, which basically means they were stolen property during wartime, which means 
according to the rules of law and our understanding during the Civil War, black people stole themselves in order to free themselves. They just massively stole themselves and each other and brought them to the Union lines to liberate themselves. And then lastly, I think, is the third version, which is that uh, really offered in many respects by Frederick Douglass and others, which is you put a black man in uniform, you give him a gun to go kill his former masters in battle, and you, there, no one will turn their freedom away. You put a Union uniform on a black man and point him at the, at the Confederate lines. This is now a war for liberation and freedom, right? So a certain version of patriotism and citizenship. Now, within these three versions of patriotism comes the last great revolution of the American Civil War, which is the rewriting of the United States Constitution. The original constitution, the flawed constitution authored by the slaveholding philosophers of freedom in Philadelphia in 1887, um, excuse me, um, these people's constitution failed. It led to a civil war. It proved incapable of bringing about uh, a meaningful resolution to this crisis. The civil war then would solve that problem, resolve that contradiction. And so Abraham Lincoln, no, just about 11 months after the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation, would it go to the battlefield at Gettysburg and deliver his most famous speech, arguably the most famous speech in American history. Um, I, you know, I won't recite it for you because um, that would be unnecessary, but what I will offer you is the following phrase. He writes, quote, that we here resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that, the, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish of the earth. What Abraham Lincoln came to Gettysburg to do was consecrate a cemetery to the Union soldiers that died in Robert E. Lee's one attempted invasion of the North. Having successfully repelled Lee's invasion, a cemetery was built, and Abraham Lincoln came not just to bury the Union dead who fought for freedom, but to bury the old constitutional system. This is a eulogy for the old American system and a declaration of a new American nation born in what will become a multiracial democracy. The products of which, the end product of which are the three constitutional amendments that come in the reconstruction era that rewrite the American constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. Now the 13th amendment as we know abolishes slavery, the 15th Amendment grants black men the right to vote and says that one cannot be denied the right, the right to vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The 14th Amendment in this regard is the most important. It is the most pervasive. It is the most all-consuming. And indeed, almost all American legal jurisprudence since 1868 is grounded in 14th Amendment law. And the 14th Amendment does multiple things that are extremely important. And we could talk about the 14th Amendment all day. <laughs> I won't, but we can. <laughs> and the 14th Amendment does a number of important things. First of all, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to this jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. Birthright citizenship. If you're born in the United States, you're a citizen. The Dred Scott decision right, uh, from the, the pre-Civil War era, said that black people could not be citizens. They were not human. They could not be citizens. It didn't matter where they were born. The 14th Amendment says if you were born in the United States, no matter what your race or identity, you're a citizen of the United States. It further goes on to say no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. What this means is that the states can't violate the Constitution. This obviates the Southern cause of the Civil War, which was to say states' rights. Right, The Civil War, if you ask a Southerner, why did the, the Civil War happen, they will tell you, you know, of a previous generation. Right, I taught in North Carolina for a few years and, and people would tell you, you know, it was states' rights, states' rights. We had the Civil War was over states' rights. The states' right to hold people in endless bondage, yes. So you're, the state right you're fighting for is slavery, right? And this, the 14th Amendment obviates the Southern cause of the Civil War and makes the federal government supreme to the states. And this is something that never sat well with the South and still does not sit well, particularly with certain strains of the modern conservative movement. 
So what you get in this era, right, is the period of reconstruction, the period in which Southern states are readmitted to the Union and that the politics of reconstruction are very complicated. But what you get out of this is that the, the Southern Republic, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. Andrew Johnson is a total drunken failure as his replacement, who is eventually impeached. He is not convicted. He's saved by one vote in the Senate, but he is marginalized. And radical Republicans in the House and Senate then set about what is referred to as radical reconstruction, in which Republican governance in Washington demands that the, the conditions under which Southern states are readmitted to the Union is that they have to ratify the three constitutional amendments. Only with the abolition of slavery, the enfranchisement of Africans, and the citizenship of African Americans can the South be readmitted to the Union. And so the Republican Party imposes Reconstruction in it, you know, and, and so what you see here are images of, right, Black folks voting for the first time, right? Black folks voting, Black folks building schools, forming um, new communities, organizing themselves politically. There was in the 1860s and 1870s, a massive wave of African-American political organization in which black people came to recognize that their very survival as a population depended on their participation in the political process, right? They had to not only organize themselves politically, educate themselves, right, because, um, and, but they had to build civic organizations and build political power. And so in the 1860s and 1870s, you got for the first time African Americans elected to the United States Congress and Senate for the first time in American history. And these are them. These are the real, I think, some of the, 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 the true founders of a new nation. As the United States attempted to build for the first time in its history, a multiracial democracy. Now, this project of building a multiracial democracy was contested by Southern Democrats at every turn. And the, the, the Republicans felt all sorts of, attempted all manner of efforts to preserve their uh, fragile Republican constituencies, Black Republican constituencies across the South, and created something like the Freedmen's Bureau, an organization that was dedicated to uplifting and providing relief to the newly emancipated, uh, formerly enslaved peoples, who literally were thrown into freedom, possessing absolutely nothing, nothing. They were liberated into the deepest poverty one could conceive of. And so the Freedmen's Bureau then steps in. And this is one version. This is what we would think of as the Republican version of, um, of the Freedmen's Bureau, in which a white man in a blue uniform stands between an angry mob of white Democrats and an equally angry mob of Black Republicans, sort of trying to keep them apart. That state intervention into, right, is going to preserve a multiracial democracy and defend African-American rights. Only through state intervention can this process hold. So you have, you know, and note that, the, you know, the, he's, he's halting one and sort of reserving the other, and the flag is draped behind him. Like, so this white man with a beard and in a uniform stands in for the federal government, the, 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 the federal flag. The, the Democrats had their own version of this, which, by and large mirrors uh, contemporary politics in all sorts of ways. In which, right, this is a democratic poster attacking the Freedmen's Bureau, in which we see, right, that it is an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man. Vote vetoed by the president, made law by Congress, support Congress and you support the Negro, sustain the president and you protect the white man. So over here are white people working hard on their farms with the biblical ordinance that they earn their bread with the sweat of their brow. And over here is the lazy, do nothing, you know, Sambo figure of the post you know, emancipation era, lying back, living off of government largesse as the government floats overhead, handing him money and protecting him so that he need not go back to work. So the belief that the government is now on the side of black people against white folks, that, they, that black people are just simply taking from the government and contributing nothing, this is the 1980s welfare debate all over again, right? There's very little that has changed in a certain sense, except for which party is advocating which specific position. To fight Reconstruction, the Democratic Party organized itself into a terrorist organization known as the Ku Klux Klan, the first Ku Klux Klan of the 1860s and 1870s. 
In the words of uh, historian Eric Foner, quote, in effect, the Ku Klux Klan was a military force driving, serving the interests of the Democratic Party, the planter class, and all those who desired restoration of white supremacy. What we see here are Klansmen, you know, in their initial outfits of the 1870s. But I want to call your attention to the picture up at the, uh, the, the top um, right side here, in which a donkey, the traditional symbol of the Democratic Party, is labeled KKK for Ku Klux Klan, in which they have lynched a carpetbagger and a scalawag. Now, these are language from the, the, the 19th century, but a carpetbagger is a northern Republican come south. So here, right, with the carpetbag labeled Ohio, and a scalawag is a southern Republican, a traitor to the race, right? And so the idea that the Democratic Party, under the control, the, the nighttime, the night riders of the Klan simply murdered their political opposition, brutalized, slaughtered them in waves of political assassination, was very much the political reality of Reconstruction and the shoals upon which Reconstruction was ultimately broken. Indeed, what we see in these cartoons written, uh, drawn by Thomas Nast, uh, easily the most important political cartoonist in American history, um, a, a major Republican figure of the, the uh, late 19th uh, century, depicts the, the end of Reconstruction in this cartoon here called This is a White Man's Government in which Northern Democrats that had rioted against the draft in 1863 in New York City, right, the here depicted as the kind of simian urban Irishman, have joined forces with the former Confederate here depicted as Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, and the namesake of Forrest Gump, the worst movie ever made. Um, or worst piece of history ever committed to film. Oh, after another film I'll talk about it in a moment. And then the, the wealthy uh, um, democratic leadership. And so what you have here is a new coalition of whiteness that seeks to link the ruling class, the middle classes, and the working classes to expand the boundaries of whiteness so as to, and the whiteness can be reforged through the virtue of each of them having one foot on the neck of the prostrate African, uh, African-American, the flag having been ground in the dirt, the ballot box prized from his hand. The disenfranchisement of African-Americans creates the basis of a new articulation of not only democratic politics, but the dominance of a new form of white supremacy in the post-emancipation era. And indeed, we see in another cartoon here, right, that says every sign pointing to a democratic victory, white people armed with guns, control the ballot boxes, black folks kept outside of the polling places. So what you have in the South in the, 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 the 1870s and 1880s is a period known as redemption, in which the former Southern, Southern plantocracy reclaims political power. Du Bois describes this very succinctly in Black Reconstruction, in which he says, most persons do not realize how far the theory of class or laboring unity failed to work in the South because the theory of race was supplemented by a carefully planned and slowly evolved method which drove such a wedge between the white and black workers that there were probably to not today in the world two groups of workers with practically identical economic interests who hate and fear each other so deeply and persistently and who are kept so far apart that neither sees anything of common interest. It must be remembered that the white groups of laborers, while they received a low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage, or what Du Bois describes as the right, the wage, the psychological wages of whiteness, in which white people were kept poor, the majority of poor whites were kept poor, they were kept marginalized, but they were granted a kind of status boost by virtue of being white, that they could rely upon politically to keep them and their economic interests, common economic interests between them and black folks separate. And so in 1877, as white supremacy spreads to the entire national democratic project or the party of the Democratic, the, the, the democratic Party, reconstruction comes to an end in the contested election of 1876. I talked about this the other day briefly. In the years after that, the modern Republican Party drifted away from the defense of black rights. They saw the South reclaim the Southern, uh, the, the, the Democratic Party control, the, the, reclaim the Southern states, and they felt that there was nothing left for them to contest, and they went off and found a new constituency in the form of the modern business corporation, 
which had been granted 14th Amendment rights as a fictitious person with the 1886 Santa Clara versus um, uh, Santa Clara case, which is the Supreme Court said that the modern business corporation is a person, a fictitious person with the rights, 14th Amendment rights. You can't deprive a corporation of its property without due process of law, despite the fact that the modern business corporation has neither soul to save nor body to incarcerate. And what you have in this period is in which the, De the Republican Party then presides over the greatest, this enormous period of capital expansion and the increasing dominance of monopoly capitalism, industrial monopoly capitalism in the Northeast. And so the modern, the modern Republican Party shifts away from the defense of black rights and the de defense of the modern business corporation monopoly capitalism. At the same time, the national project commits itself to white supremacy, particularly with the Plessy versus Ferguson case, um, in which the United States Supreme Court legalized segregation, which emerged as the Southern solution to its social problem. Black people can be free, but they must be held separately. They cannot go to the same schools. They cannot vote in the same elections. They can't be buried in the same cemeteries. They can't appear in the same hospitals. They can't sit in the same movie theaters. They can't sit on the same buses. And the US Supreme Court upheld Plessy versus Ferguson basically by saying that black people are biologically inferior and the constitution is powerless to make it otherwise. This then institutes what we today know of as the period of the era of Jim Crow, dominated by racial segregation across the South, in which the United States' largest racial, ethnic, or religious minority was systematically stripped and denied the right to vote, and in which Southern Democrats dominated, the, uh, completely controlled uh, the politics of the South. This project of the age of Jim Crow became a national one at the start of the 20th century, particularly with the election of the first Democrat to the White House since the end of the Civil War, namely Woodrow Wilson, professor of history, former president of Princeton University, president of, excuse me, governor of New Jersey, and who became president of the United States, who offered his uh, support of the massive project of rewriting the history of the Civil War through the lost cause metaphor by lending his explicit support to the greatest movie ever made. Made by D.W. Griffith in 1915, Birth of a Nation was the longest, most expensive, most elaborate, fastest grossing movie of, ev of all time. It established Hollywood as a culture industry and indeed um, made the feature film into the dominant art form of the 20th century. And it did so by telling the story of the Civil War and Reconstruction through the heroism of the Ku Klux Klan. It was based on a novel written by Thomas Dixon, who was college buddies with Woodrow Wilson, and then added to D.W. Griffith, who was himself a child of the defeated South. His father was a Confederate cavalry officer uh, from Kentucky. Griffith set out to make this film. It is, you know, close to three hours long. You take my race in American film class, I will show it to you, and that is not a threat. Um, but it then features the heroism of the Ku Klux Klan as the terms and conditions in which the new nation would be born. Let me see if I can get this to play. I need this to play very briefly. <laughs> This is the end of the movie in which the Ku Klux Klan has successfully reunited enemies north and south, Democrat and Republican, male and female, and is chasing black folks who had seized political power off the stage, right? The parade of Klansmen arrives and white people, wait, can you still, you can still see my, can you see my screen? Yes, okay, sorry. Um, so black folks run away, they hide from the Klan, the, the, the crowd ran, you know, celebrates and, and cheers them on, while white folks of all classes and identities look on and see, right, the common interest in the victory of the Ku Klux Klan. This is where Hollywood comes from, people. This was the first Hollywood blockbuster. This was the biggest movie ever made. It was also the first film ever shown in the White House. Woodrow Wilson, having attended a screening of Birth of a Nation in the White House, claimed, quote, oh, this is the, this is the next election, right? So if you just want to know what's at stake here, this is the next election. Black folks come out of their houses to vote, and no, I don't think I'll be voting this year. Right? So it is celebrating on a national scale the disfranchisement of African Americans. 
D.W. Griffith, excuse me, Woodrow Wilson said that this movie is, quote, like history written with lightning. And my only regret is that it is all so terribly true. Bill. Birth of a Nation was not just some foolish movie with no consequences. Birth of a Nation's popularity in 1915, 50 years after the end of the Civil War, led directly to the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan in 1915 in Stone Mountain, Georgia. The second Ku Klux Klan born out of a movie. At its peak in the 1920s, the organization included about four to five million men which is about 15% of the nation's eligible population. This clan was more ecumenical in its hatred in that it hated Catholics, Jews, immigrants, the new women, it hated prohibi it, it pushed prohibition and the like, and controlled state governments across the United States, in particular in places like Colorado, Indiana, Oklahoma, and Pasadena, California. The clan pushed a pornography of racism in which white men's responsibility was to contain black men's political ambitions um, by chasing them off the stage. And in so doing, they ensured, right, that the basic belief of the Jim Crow system is about sex. I can break this down very quickly. Jim Crow is about sex, okay? Just on a very basic level. If you believe in the superiority of one race and the inferiority of the other, you believe then, right, in racial hierarchy, that, that, preservation of superiority, inferiority, and purity must be policed on sexual boundaries. White men in the post-Civil War era came to believe that black men only sought political power so as to gain access to white women. And so as to pervert, pres preserve and protect the purity of white women, the sexual purity of white women. And this is all the melodrama of Birth of a Nation, right? The threat of white women being raped by black men is ubiquitous in Birth of a Nation. It is the singular libidinal motive, motivating force of the entire film. So the new class of the, of the Democratic Party came to believe that they needed to contain black men's political aspirations, to chase them off stage and corral white women in the home at the same time. So you have this kind of intersectionality between anti-blackness and anti-feminism so that this new class of white men keep white women in the home in the name of protecting them and keep black men off the political stage in the name of building a national white supremacist politics. This politics was broadly kept in place by the history of lynching, the most brutal enforcement of the racial and sexual code of Jim Crow in the United States. At his apex between the 1890s and the 1930s, lynching claimed roughly 3,500 lives. 88% of whom were Southern black men, 19%, only 19% were even accused of sexually assaulting white women. This means that there was a lynching and the extrajudicial murder of a black man or a black person in the, across the country, the lynching of one, th one to three black people a week for nearly four decades. Indeed, lynchings peaked in 1892, but it was, uh, excuse me, 1919, excuse me. Uh, no, I, I take that back. Lyn lynchings peaked in 1892 with a spike in 1919, but 1954 was the first year in recorded US history without a lynching. And this is from, of course, Marion, Indiana, uh, the, lynching, the lynching of Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith. But what I wanna call your attention to is less the bodies, and it is deeply heroic, but this couple here, who seem to be furtively holding hands as if they were on some kind of date that white people could assemble at the base of a mass murder uh, in a kind of civic uh, collective uh, common enterprise. Um, this, I think, is the real horror of lynching. Now, I need to sort of jump ahead, which is to say that the Great Depression of the 1930s scrambled all of this. The Republicans dominated national politics through the 1920s, but they were defeated by the crash of 1929, which brought in a new political coalition led by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal. The New Deal promised government intervention into the economy so as to rebuild the country in the wake of the collapse the great, of the Great Depression. Now, Roosevelt built a new political coalition of Northern liberals and Southern Democrats. He was a Democrat, and he had a substantive base of urban Northern liberals that he could draw on, and a substantive base of Southern um, Democrats that could form the new political coalition necessary to remake the American state in an, in an interventionist phase known as the New Deal. 
that now all of this detail is not particularly is not important. I can't go into all of this, but the multiple, multiple, multiple new government agencies created during the Great Depression were created by Roosevelt in an attempt to right get the economy started again. And he had to do this using Southern votes. Now he did this by in fact, promising, indeed, and we've talked about this too, that Southern African Americans would not be included in New Deal programs. Saru talked about this in some detail around tipping, in particular, that they were kept out of New Deal programs. Um, and so that anti-Blackness you know, suffuses the New Deal, but it did create a situation in which Black people, for the first time, started to vote for the Democratic Party. They started to break from the Republicans that had abandoned them and started to vote for Democrats, particularly in Northern states, because they saw that Democrats actually wanted their votes and that the Rooseveltian Democrats were intervening into the economy to support black people in certain ways. There was also a massive social movement in the 1930s, broadly referred to as the Popular Front, that linked the collection of social democratic, pro-union and anti-lynching political forces, anti-fascist, forces in the United States in the 1930s to push Roosevelt farther and farther to the left. And as Roosevelt moved to the left, the Republicans became increasingly anti-statist, increasingly anti-intervention, increasingly anti-New Deal. With the coming of World War II then, a new um, black folks become increasingly solidified in the Republican, in the Democratic Party. Despite the fact that the United States waged a war on a racist enemy with a segregated army, meaning black, and black Americans fought in segregated military units during World War II. There began during World War II a massive new social justice movement, the broader black freedom struggle that identified itself through A. Philip Randolph's Double V campaign. Victory over fascism abroad, victory over Jim Crow at home. And who could not, would not argue that the Klan is not a version of American fascism? free from want, free from fear, free, free from Jim Crow. A. Philip Randolph pushed this agenda quite successfully and quite aggressively. Indeed, threatening, as the leader of the, 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 the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the, the largest African-American union in the country that Professor Jai Rahman uh, referenced the other day, A. Philip Randolph went to Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1941 and threatened to bring 100,000 black workers to march on Washington, D.C. unless Roosevelt integrated the defense plans. And indeed, at the behest of Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed what is probably the most consequential um, executive order in American history, Executive Order 8802, in which he, with a stroke of a pen, desegregated the American defense plants and set off the second great migration of African Americans moving from the Southwest, in particular to California. So how did Oakland become a black city? How did South Central and Compton become a black city? How do we have black populations in Seattle and across the West? A single executive order advanced and advocated by A. Philip Randolph. Now, A. Philip Randolph, so those of you who are, are, who are black and who live in the Bay Area, the cha or are from the Bay Area, the chances are that your family came here from Louisiana, Texas, or Arkansas sometime during the war or immediately thereafter. You can thank Franklin Delano Roosevelt for that possibility. Now, of course, A. Philip Randolph did not have his march on Washington in 1941. Instead, it had to wait until 1963 in which A. Philip Randolph, seen here next to Bayard Rustin as the two lead organizers of the 1963 March on Washington. So, you know, shout out to A. Philip Randolph, everyone's famous, uh, everyone's favorite black socialist, um, who, you know, I mean, he, he was a socialist from the, the entirety of his existence. And yes, he's the man that created the platform that gave Martin Luther King uh, the, the I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> this is the radical background between these two great organizers. This process of federal intervention through the war continues after the war, in which Harry Truman then takes up another executive order, 9981, to integrate the United States military, so that the Korean War fought between 1950 and 1953 would be the first American war fought in which black and white people fought in integrated units. But this threat to integrate the United States military caused the first stirrings of a Southern revolt against the New Deal and a Southern revolt against the New Deal coalition, led by Southern segregationist de Democrat Strom Thurmond. A revolt in 1948 known as the Dixiecrats threatened to split the Democratic Party on racial lines. 
Now, this threat to split the Democratic Party on those lines comes to a full head when we get to America's second reconstruction, which begins with the Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, 1954, which declares Plessy versus Ferguson unconstitutional. And it brings, right, demands with, quote, all deliberate speed that Southern states desegregate all social institutions. This leads on the one hand, this is a massive legal uh, victory for a multiracial democracy, but it leads to an extraordinary backlash, right, of growing anti-Black sentiment within the Democratic Party initially, right, such that Republican presidents, namely Dwight Eisenhower, will have to send federal marshals into Little Rock, Arkansas to ensure that nine school children can integrate Little Rock High School in the, 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 the fall semester of 1958. These are federal marshals sent by Dwight Eisenhower to Little Rock, right, to enforce integration against Southern white supremacist Democratic um, Party rule. You get the spread of what is known as massive resistance, white citizens councils. This is absolutely one of my favorite images from this era of race mixing is communism. <laughs> you ask me, that's an endorsement. I don't, I, yeah, anyways. Um, uh, but this then kicks on to an even higher ground in 1960 with the emergence of the student movement, SNCC, and the direct action movements, which we will get to in some detail in subsequent lectures. This is the date that we should all keep in mind, February 1st, 1960, in which four college students from Carolina A&T in Greensboro, North Carolina, found a sit founded a sit-in at the Woolworths lunch counter that would eventually spread to create what I think is the most kick-ass social movement in American history, namely SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. By 1964, the Black Civil Rights Movement has effectively seized and gained political power, such that Lyndon Johnson signs in 1964 the landmark legislation of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. Lyndon Johnson, a senator from Texas, Southern Democrat of the Democratic Party, who pushed massive state interventions in his great society programs, in his attempt to defend civil rights and the like, said to one of his closest advisors in signing the 64 Civil Rights Act that, quote, we are signing away the South for a generation or more. That the Democratic Party, he knew that in making this decision that the Democratic Party would lose control in the South. And indeed, he was right. And it began with Southern Democrats like George Wallace, governor of Alabama, the openly segregationist governor of Alabama who proclaimed, right, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And this is the Ian Haney Lopez readings that um, we have talked about. But the, the shift really begins then when Barry Goldwater runs for president on the Republican Party ticket as a conservative for the first time the language of the conservative. And as he says, quote, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a salesman trying to sell the conservative view of government. And his libertarian views of that the free market should rule and that government should get out of the way proved enormously popular with a rising generation of Republican activists like Newt Gingrich and Pat Buchanan and Ronald Reagan and others. Now, of course, Goldwater was wiped out in, by Lyndon Johnson in 1964. But his move into presidential politics in the name of conservatism would eventually lead to the great champion of the conservative movement, namely Ronald Reagan, who wins the Democratic, excuse me, runs the, wins the Republican race for governor of California in 1966, in particular on a platform opposing anti-discrimination in housing. Though Lyndon Johnson won California in 1964, so did Prop 14, which was a ballot measure that undid a 1963 law banning racial discrimination in the sale of homes. When the state Supreme Court threw out the election returns of Prop 14, no one benefited more from voters' anger than the former actor turned conservative politician Ronald Reagan, who ran for governor on a platform that defended the rights of homeowners, quote, in a free society to discriminate against Negroes if they choose. So Ronald Reagan ran for governor in 1966 on the rights of white people to discriminate against black people if they chose. He also ran against what he calls the morality gap at Berkeley, claiming that, quote, a small minority of beatniks, radicals, and filthy speech advocates were attempting to seize the university as, quote, a rallying point for communists and a center for sexual misconduct. 
Sounds fun, huh? Anyways, Ronald Reagan. Berkeley, uh, he has a relationship to Berkeley. Of course, he blames everything on Berkeley. And so Berkeley returns the favor by blaming everything that has ever gone wrong in American history on Ronald Reagan. We have a good relationship. Strom Thurmond here is really the key figure though, however, and I realize I'm going over here and I apologize. This is just entirely too much trying to go on. I will end in four minutes, no matter where I'm at. But Strom Thurmond um, is the leading figure of what becomes known as the Southern strategy in which white segregationists increasingly begin to join the Republican Party. And Strom Thurmond creates a bargain with Richard Nixon in particular, in which Strom Thurmond is allowed to switch parties while preserving his highly coveted seniority and, ch and committee chairmanships. If traditionally, if you switch parties, you start at the bottom. Strom Thurmond was allowed to preserve his very powerful committee chairmanships in switching parties. And he began the process of moving Southern segregationist Democrats into the Republican Party. This is a process that would indeed take decades and split the Republicans. And, and indeed, it's important to remember that the party system was not as polarized as it is now in previous eras. You had Northern conservatives and Southern conservatives. You had Northern um, liberals and Southern liberals. And that they, so if you look at the voting, the voting record of the 64 vote, Voting Rights Act, it was bipartisan, but by ideology, not by region. The South voted comprehensively against it, both Democrat and Republican, and the North and West voted comprehensively for it, both Democrat and Republican. And so what you get right, Richard Nixon leads the Southern strategy in 1968, and it is pushed by one of his wily, um, kind of uh, major figures in founding the kind of modern field of computational political science, a man by the name of Kevin Phillips, who sets out the Southern strategy saying here, right, it's all in the charts. Kevin Phillips writes, quote, from now on, the Republicans are never going to get more than 10 to 20% of the Negro vote, and they don't need any more than that. But the Republicans would be short-sighted if they weakened democratic enforcement of the voting rights. Act. The more Negroes who vote register as Democrats in the South, the sooner the Negrophobe whites will quit the Democrats and become Republicans. That's where the votes are. Without that, prodding from the Blacks, the whites will backslide into their own comfortable arrangements with the, Dem the local Democrats. So what the Southern strategy is, is an attempt to um, essentially benefit from the racial resentments and hostilities of white people and attract them to the Republican Party. This has never been more clearly articulated than in the, the now kind of infamous words of Lee Atwater, who was Republican, who was Ronald Reagan's uh, campaign manager, George Herbert Walker Bush's campaign manager, a major figure in Republican politics, the one of the founding figures of what Ian Haney Lopez calls dog whistle politics. This is um, uh, Lee Atwater in 1982, and I uh, just want to apologize for what you're about to, the language you're about to hear here. Hang on, let me. Here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician by like political science, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract the, you handle the race line. In other words, you start out, and, and now y'all aren't quoting me. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts your backfire. So you say stuff like uh, force busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now. You're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things. You're talking about are totally economic things. And the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, uh, that, that, we, that we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. Uh, you follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than never knew, you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. Right. This is how you mobilize racial, the racial resentment of white people without appearing racist yourself. You use coded language, forced busing, right? Tax cuts, all of these kinds of things. And you can bring 
Southern segregationists into the Republican Party at the same time that Northern and indeed like, you know, um, integrationist pro-civil rights organizations across the entire country then join the Democratic Party. And so what you have by the early 1970s is what we know of as the Great Backlash, symbolized here quite powerfully in Stanley Foreman's Pulitzer Prize winning photograph from Boston 1967, The Soiling of Old Glory, in which a group of working class white kids in Boston are attempting to skewer a black lawyer in downtown Boston with the American flag outside of a political hearing in which the Boston busing crisis is being adjudicated inside the courthouse behind them. So outside you have a political fight in which white kids are attacking a black lawyer with the American flag. I, 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 this photograph is, is hugely significant. The great achievement of this era then, of course, is Ronald Reagan. And just, you know, just, just so you know, like everything that is, that is new, old is new again, Ronald Reagan, let's make America great again, again. Um, you know, Reagan in this right light ran for president on an explicitly uh, racial note. He, he, he launched his campaign uh, for the presidency in the same Mississippi town that Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were disappeared in, in 1964, claiming that the, ci the civil rights movement was, quote, humiliating to the South. And he used this project uh, to build himself a new coalition in which the Republicans at this point have fully just switched sides with the Democrats. The two parties have exchanged their political position uh, such, and, and indeed it's worth noting, and this is, I'll just end on this note, uh, with the words of Corey Robin, who writes about what, what do we, what is conservatism besides a commitment to white racial rule? And I think it needs to be understood that conservatism is largely best understood as a commitment to white racial rule. But here, Corey Robin offers us this. What is, conser this, for this is what conservatism is, a meditation on and a theoretical, theoretical rendering of the felt experience of having power, seeing it threatened, and trying to win it back. And this is why you get Obama, you get the Tea Party, and you get George, you, you get Donald Trump. Indeed, like I offer you this, this is from um, Dying of Whiteness by Jonathan Metzl, in which he argues that the, the wages of whiteness don't pay dividends anymore. But I would offer you this slogan of consider your man card reissued, which I think he has just a stunningly brilliant analysis of, uh, as a, a version of conservatism, right? Someone took your manhood, get it back by buying a gun. Of course, the one thing that we learned in all of this at least if you read um, uh, Jonathan Metzl, is that white men in Missouri were seven times more likely to turn their guns against themselves to, and, than, to be, uh, than to, to use them against intruders uh, in their castles, right? So that what you get when you liberalize gun laws, when the conservative governance and backlash governance comes to your state, what do you get in Missouri when you, li li you liberalize the gun laws? White men whose economic foundations and economic prospects have been declining precipitously in the last several decades, you get wave after wave of handgun suicide. The wages of whiteness don't pay dividends anymore. Whiteness is in fact killing us as a nation. All right, I've gone on way too long. I sincerely apologize. What questions do you have for me? Uh, Rikita? Yeah, I pronounced my name Rikika. Rikika. Yes. Sorry, you um, said that to me once before. See, this is, uh, sorry. Please go ahead. I, I, no, I look forward uh, to your question. <laughs> I, I was just curious because you did comment upon Forrest Gump and how it's problematic, and I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate upon that. Because, yeah. um, it is a right-wing movie, okay? Um, an explicitly right-wing movie designed by right-wingers for right-wing audiences. It was, New, it was Newt Gingrich's favorite movie. Um, to, to start with the fact that, that Forrest himself was named after the Confederate cavalryman that founded the Ku Klux Klan, Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, that somehow he magically taught Elvis how to dance when we, in fact, do know that Black people taught Elvis how to dance, that he played football at a segregated university and never stood up or said anything in the defense of, of integration, that he gladly fought in the war in Vietnam and never criticized or thought even deeply about what he was doing, 
that the anti-war movement had nothing more than to just stand up in front of uh, the, the Washington Monument and yell fuck into cameras, or that the Black Panther Party are reduced exclusively to wearing leather jackets and black berets and, uh, and, and abuse uh, white women. That uh, the girl, Jenny, who um, is a, abused by her father, which leads her to become an anti-war activist, then leads her to become a feminist, which leads her to become addicted to drugs and die of AIDS. Should I continue? It's a right-wing movie. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, you're more than welcome. Yeah. I saw that movie once. It has been scarred into my brain ever since. Uh, Adrian, you're a new voice. Hi, Anna. I had a question about the origins of, uh, of uh, factionalism, and you said it, talked, it came from uh, federalisms and anti-federalists. That's one part of it, yeah. Is that your question? Go ahead. Oh, if you could like, elaborate on, it, on like, its origin and how it proliferated. Well, I mean, my argument on the one hand that the political parties like in the, 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 in, in the 18th century, the, there's a lot of different political factions that are kind of tr starting to organize themselves. And you can watch if you look at you, you cover the history of that, that period. Let me um, stop sharing here because I don't want any of you to go out and try and buy a Bushmaster. Not that you're in any danger of doing that. Um, I mean, come on, you think of the name of the gun. I mean, like everything about that is just terrifying. Anyways. Um, if you look at the, the, the late 18th century, there are lots of different competing factions attempting to put together political parties. They're, they're often kind of regional. Uh, they're shaped by the, the limitations on communications and the great distances to be traveled, the need to build a national organization and entity. And you eventually see them slowly grow and crystallize. But my argument is that the two-party system was an inevitable outgrowth of the first past the post election process. That if, if, if there are no points for second place, then everybody just needs to form themselves into two political parties and butt heads. And that quickly then becomes the case. And the original version of that, in some sense, is the Federalist and Anti-Federalist, because the Constitution is written, it is then submitted, and needs to be ratified by the white male property holding uh, people who are enfranchised in the, 18, the 1780s. And so they form themselves into two political parties, which then build out into the subsequent political parties. Now, I am, I will say, I am not an expert in 18th century American history, but that's largely the outline. Thanks. Sure. Um, Shay, uh, Ellison? Um, my question is more about where exactly did the two parties change their position? I understand that they were switched kind of up until the Reagan-Bush era, but what made them switch? Was that just like a casual overnight thing? Or oh, no, no, no. It exactly. was a very long, complicated, drawn-out process by which, right, um, Democrats became the party of civil rights and Republicans became the party of the Confederacy. I mean, who defends the flying of the Confederate flag now? It certainly wasn't the people that made it. The Democrats, right? The Democrats want the flag taken down. The Republicans are the ones who believe in heritage, not hate, and the need to sort of preserve the Confederate. So this happened by and large in response to the civil rights movement and the claiming of black rights. So my argument to boil it down is this. The black radical tradition in which African-American civil rights organizations in Reconstruction in the 1860s and 1870s and in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s advocated for a multiracial democratic system in which black people would be enshrined as citizens, have the right to vote, and have their political needs taken seriously. White people rebelled against both of those waves of black expansion of the democracy, and in so doing, created a reversal of the political parties. So that the Republicans, right, become the party of black civil rights, that they eventually, in, in the 1860s and 1870s, that they will eventually abandon in the 1960s, and the two parties will effectively switch sides. It takes a long time time. That process has not completely re resolved itself until the 1980s and really even to the, 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 the 1990s, well into the Clinton era. I mean, Clinton was a, a liberal Democrat from Arkansas. He was the Democratic governor of Arkansas when he was elected, right? Now he's a neoliberal, but he was the, he was the Democratic governor of Arkansas. And so you had Southern Democrats in, you know, who, who had national profiles and you had Northern Republicans, uh, in states like New York and in uh, Illinois and, and across the, the game. Those are largely gone, right? There, there, are, all, there are very, very few um, Democratic Southerners, uh, Democratic senators in Southern states, and there's, there's even fewer Republican senators in Northern states at this point. 
right? So red state, blue state, like we tend to think that that's how it's always been, but the parties tended to previously be organized by conservative and liberal Northern and Southern. And those would have been the axes that often cut across party lines. Today, they've essentially all resolved themselves into a red conservative, blue liberal uh, two party system. And that system, my argument is, is breaking down. It's proving um, that we, we, we're increasingly incapable of governing ourselves because of how seriously we take uh, those divides, right? It, it's, you know, the, I, I, you know, the, the, I, 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 I tend to think that it's, it's one of, it's axiomatic that the, 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 the kind of emotional uh, purpose of the Republican Party at this point is to own the libs. Like the purpose of their party is to make us, you know, is to make liberals feel bad. That's, that's why, they, that's what they do. Now they have, now keep in mind all the stuff that Sarah was talking about the other day, they have very serious economic policy agendas and initiatives that they are trying to get through. And indeed what you do have, I mean, Gore Vidal famously said that the United States has one political party with two right wings. And I think, and that is the party of capital. And I think that is a hundred percent correct, right? The center, the political system, the center of the political system is the party of capital, the party of neoliberalism, the party of big business, of Wall Street, of finance. And then that you have the margins of the, nas the nationalist far right and the sort of social democratic left that, that fight against the center without being able to unify with each other because one is anti-racist and the other is explicitly white nationalist. And so you have this kind of real core political problem. Uh, but it should be said that the thing that holds the two, the center, what holds the center is the party of capital. Sarah, do you want to say something about this? Yeah, I just want to reiterate something you said at the beginning of your lecture, which is, but what that center is changes from time to time. It is not static. And to, reiterate, to kind of tie together what I was talking about, whether, what Professor Cohen's talking about, it changes actually based on social movements. Social movements have a huge impact on what the center is, on where the left is, where the right is. The social movement is it is not elections, it is social movements that actually, you know, change public opinion. And we've seen that with Black Lives Matter. So I think it's so important to note that none of this is static. It, you know, the center can be, in the 1930s, it can be, um, you know, a social compact with workers that includes social security and minimum wage and you, the right to unionize. And the center now looks at those things as somehow left or radical. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, let's go for the last question, uh, Zoe. I'm going for people I have not heard from before. So I would like, you know, I, I, I thank those of you who are raising your hand to ask questions who have not spoken before. Uh, yeah, so I have my dad here with me who's an alum and he was wondering um, how you think that Professor Michael Rogan's portrayal of Trump would differ from Reagan's. This is one of my absolute favorite books. Tell your dad that I'm a huge fan of Michael Rogan, the greatest political scientist to ever teach at Cal. <laughs> no second place on that one. I love Wendy Brown, much respect of Wendy Brown, but like Mike, what I, I think, like I miss Michael Rogan so much. This is his book called Ronald Reagan, the movie, in which he reads Reagan's politics through his presentation on screen. Rogan was also the guy that, that explained Birth of a Nation to me, I think, most comprehensively. What would Rogan have made of, of Donald Trump? Uh, to, very briefly, that whole argument about how this, the, the, the paranoia on the fringes is the price we pay for integrity at the center. Rogan would have been the guy to help us understand what happens when the paranoid fringe takes over the center. He would have been the guy that would help us understand what happens when a conspiracy theorist and an overt racist takes the center of political power that had previously kept those things quite marginal and banished. And I think he, I, I miss Rogan very, very profoundly. I think he would have been the guy uh, that, that we look to to explain it to us. I, I think that what I've done today, what I'm trying to offer just now is a version of what Rogan would have provided us with. But I, when I do talk about fascism and anti-fascism, I will go back to Michael Rogan. So tell your dad, like, big up, go Bears. Uh, thanks for being here. And, um, and with that, I, uh, I will uh, thank you all for being here. I will stick around if anybody else has any questions, but I'm going to end the recording. Thank you all for putting up with my, this is the longest lecture you will ever, you'll have to hear from me from the, the end. I, I, I won't take up anywhere near this much time for the rest of the class. So thank you all. Bye.